About a year ago, I started learning Mandarin Chinese. One of the first questions I had was, how do you type in Chinese? Do I need a special keyboard or what do you do? Once I learned how to type with a modern computer and on my phone, I started to wonder, well, how do we do this with a typewriter? And what does a Chinese keyboard even look like? I had no idea how complicated this engineering problem was and how many large companies back in the day completely failed to make a Chinese typewriter and how one guy in the 1940s made a simple marvel of engineering. He even invented what I would consider to be the earliest version of predictive text. I think the only way I can explain the true novelty and marvel of engineering that we're gonna be looking at in the uh, Ming Kuai, which is the name of the typewriter, we're gonna need to take a look at how a regular typewriter works. So today we're gonna try to find an old fashioned typewriter and then we will discuss how we're gonna squeeze tens of thousands of Chinese characters into something you can sit in front of. Let's get started. Prior to the 1800s, if you wanted to have memos, notes, write a letter, business transactions, even just basic receipts, they were all written by hand. I am not seeing a typewriter. I've been calling around all day trying to find somebody with a uh, old typewriter and I think we finally have one. They even sent me a picture as proof. Certainly the printing press had been invented by that time, but it was really impractical if you just needed one or two copies, you would just pay somebody to hand write it. However, once we had a typewriter, it completely revolutionized the way we work inside of our offices. And our typewriter should be somewhere around here. Oh, look at that. Jeremy. I am. We found it after you called. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll take it. All right, let's get this guy cleaned up and we'll talk about typewriters. Before we talk about the mechanics of the typewriter, I just want to make sure you understand just how big of a deal this was. Even if you completely disregard how this improved business, and it did, just governments alone hired armies of people to keep up with property records, keep up with tax documents. All of this stuff was handwritten. Top secret documents, military communications for moving your troops around were all handwritten. Imagine now one typist can exponentially increase the rate at which you can send out communications. All of the big companies at the time, like Lionel Type, Remington, IBM, there's several others. These large companies were all looking for opportunities to expand into other countries. And this was very easy for the languages in, that were based on the Latin alphabet. Basically, you wipe out the English letters and you slap on the letters that correspond to the language. But that didn't work so well for languages that were non-alphabetic. And even some languages that do have an alphabet don't have the same sort of uniformity that English has. This created a huge problem for languages like Bengali, for Arabic, Korean, Chinese, Japanese. You can't just wipe out the English letters anymore and slap on the other language. You're gonna have to fundamentally change the way the machine works. Arabic, for example, not only do the letters go from right to left, that's a pretty easy engineering problem to solve. The letters also change shape depending upon where they are in the word and all the letters are connected. This is gonna change the way the machine works. The Korean language, Hangul, is another example of a language where they sort of have an alphabet, they teach it like an alphabet, but these letters aren't uniform. They move and change position both vertically and horizontally, they even stack, depending upon how you pronounce the word. This is gonna fundamentally change, again, the way that the typewriter works. At the end of the day though, we figured out workarounds for most of these problems, but Chinese was particularly hard and it was not for a lack of trying. Every one of the giants in engineering the typewriter failed miserably at making a Chinese typewriter. It was so bad, 
it became a running joke in the English speaking world that making a Chinese typewriter was literally impossible. It was not going to happen. This created a crisis for China. If they were going to keep up with the rest of the world and do commerce on a global stage, they needed to be able to speed up their communications. Now, this certainly brought up a debate about whether they should develop an alphabet in China, and I won't get into that because that's a whole thing all by itself. But I do want to summarize by saying, at the end of the day, they love their characters. They have thousands of years of history baked into these characters. They love calligraphy. It's a part of their culture, and they want to keep it. This is not an abnormal thing in engineering. Before we can talk about a solution, let's carefully define a problem. And I think at its core, the problem is we want to be able to write messages in the native language. For Chinese, we want to communicate in writing in Chinese. So let's take a brief look at how the English typewriter does that, and then that'll make a much easier parallel to how this Chinese typewriter did it. If you've been following this channel for any length of time, you know that I love to get my kids involved and what I'm excited about. I am frequently bringing them out to the shop. You see them at the CNC with me. You see them when I'm working on the robot. But behind the scenes, I'm also making air cannons. We're doing science experiments in the kitchen. And that's where KiwiCo comes in. You can have these crates delivered to your house, which are based on steam concepts. Each of the crates are designed with a specific age and interest in mind. So you could hand this box to your kid and they are able to handle it on their own. But let me tell you how we do it at my house. Typically, we do it together. We will either jump down on the floor and all build our crates together, or we'll just sit at the kitchen table. Although you may have also noticed my oldest daughter is missing now. She's gone off to college and grown all up with her big self. So anyway, uh, the rest of us put our crates together and we have a blast. <laughs> go, 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 go. We put our crates together yesterday, and while I enjoy putting a roller coaster together, I have to admit, the fire lab completely stole the show at the table. Listen, we've been doing this for four years now, and I've never been disappointed. My kids always love it. So here's the bottom line. You can have awesomeness delivered to your house, you can send it to your favorite little nieces and nephews, and you can even get a discount by going to kiwico.com slash building50. That's kiwico.com slash building50 to get 50% off of your first month's crate, and you'll be supporting this YouTube channel. Now, of course, this machine has an impressive array of levers, linkages, springs. It's actually pretty incredible how this guy works as well, but we'll save that for another video. The only concepts we need to capture from this machine that really made this problem difficult is when you type English on this machine, you're not typing words, you are typing letters. You use the letters to build up the words. That's critical. If we just start typing letters, if they're not arranged properly, like this is not a word, it doesn't mean anything. So here's what's so powerful about that. With just 26 letters and some special characters, we can literally build the entire language. All of our vocabulary is contained right here in the 26 letters and a few special characters. And this also means that any new words that are developed in the English language will also conform to this typewriter. That's hugely powerful. Let's switch over to Chinese. Every word in Chinese is a unique character. There's no alphabet. Chinese characters do have something called radicals, which is a, a component of the character that's common to many characters, but that's not really sufficient as an alphabet. In fact, there are about 200 radicals. So even if we tried to use radicals as an alphabet, we'd only have part of the word because not all the parts are radicals and you'd need 200 of them. With English, the letters are all the same size and equally spaced. Their uniformity makes them conform to machines very well. We don't have that in Chinese. Sometimes the radicals themselves change shape, they change size, and they morph depending upon their position in the character. And that makes it uniquely hard, which means that even each radical will need a variation in order to be used properly. Now, English also has variation in the way we present words. For example, I can put capital letters, right? So capital letters, of course, doubles the number of letters that you need on a keyboard. And there were actually keyboards in the early days that had capital letters on one side and lowercase letters on the other. But pretty soon some clever engineers figured out how to stack the capital letters just above the lowercase letters. And by hitting shift, you can move the whole rack up and down like so, allowing the capital letters or the lowercase letter to be stamped at the right height. But even with this invention, we still have the same problem of the sheer number of characters. With 200 radicals and tens of thousands of Chinese words, each one unique, 
it's very difficult to cram all of that information into the typewriter. So there doesn't seem to be a practical way to spell Chinese, but we need to be able to access all the words in the vocabulary of the Chinese language. Therefore, we have a retrieval problem. How do we get the right word that we want in order to communicate that in an efficient manner? It's certainly not practical to put tens of thousands of characters in front of a user, but maybe you could put a couple thousand characters in front of the user, and that's actually what they did. If you looked at the most frequently used characters, there were only about 2,500 characters that were being used a lot. Even just figuring out which 2,500 characters to use was quite an undertaking in itself. They basically did a frequency analysis. By hand, they took everything from children's books to research papers and counted how often a certain character was used. Take the top 2,500 and bam, you have now limited the number of characters you need in order to get 90% of the text that we normally see written in Chinese. There's a great video on YouTube which shows a typical example of one of these tray bed printers in action. I will put a link to this video in the description, but as you can see, the premise is basically the user can move the entire tray around and each one of those tiny little blocks is a unique character. Once the type has found the character that they want, they pull down on the lever, it would reach down, grab the character up out of the tray, swing it up, slam it against the paper, and then drop it back into the tray. Now this was certainly an improvement over handwriting in terms of both legibility and speed. And that brings us to this man, Lin Yutong. This guy was not only a prolific writer, both in English as well as in Chinese. If you look at the patent, it is unbelievably complicated, this machine that he invented. But we're gonna take the most basic elements of it and walk through it. He came up with a really clever system for breaking these characters up into components. He completely disregarded all the previous systems that had been devised before in terms of how many strokes does the character have and what kind of radical does it have and everything that was in their dictionaries before that. And he was like, forget all that. I'm gonna make up my own special characters. And that's what he did. When you look at this keyboard, it looks like Chinese and it will be recognizable to a Chinese speaker, but there are there's no Chinese language here. These are just pieces, if you will, of Chinese characters. The ones along the top represent a piece taken from the upper portion of the character, and the ones along the bottom represent the lower piece. So here's the magic. You push one of the buttons at the top first, and you will hear gears rolling inside of the machine. There's actually a whole series of uh, like a planetary gear with rollers within rollers spinning over inside of the machine to align up the right set of characters corresponding to the key that you just pressed. And then you're gonna hit a bottom key and you'll hear more movement and cranking inside of the machine. And that is the carriage lining up along that long row of characters with a narrow width of characters for you to select from. And at this stage, there's a viewing window that you will look through and you have eight characters to choose from. It's really amazing to me how much effort went into sorting these characters so that you'd always have about eight characters in the window. I've been looking into this for many months now and there's just so many rabbit holes I wanna go down. So I'm trying to restrain myself. The magic is in this. By just picking two little pieces of the character he has narrowed it down to just eight characters that fit the criteria that you've selected. Like I said at the beginning of the video, this is basically predictive text. In most modern apps today, when you start typing letters, the software is already trying to predict what words you wanna use. And that's exactly what's happening here. All you need is two pieces of a character and it gives you eight characters to choose from. You pick one of the numbers, it stamps a character on the page. So now, Instead of trying to choose from thousands of characters, every word is only three letters now. That to me is incredible. Now, there's a whole bunch of other clever mechanisms in here, like this machine was capable of putting together combinations of characters as well, which means you ended up with 90,000 possible characters you could get from this machine. Now, all of those aren't actual words. There are combinations in there that don't mean anything. But the point is, you've got access to the whole Chinese vocabulary, and this was revolutionary. Okay, I got some breaking news for you. It turns out that a group of guys in China actually replicated this machine. The video just came out last month, so I almost missed the opportunity to share this with you. It was amazing for me to see this thing actually come to life. According to the video, rather than duplicate the patent exactly, they replicated the functionality of the machine with modern day components. And let me tell you, it's amazing to watch. Unfortunately for my English speaking audience, which is <laughs> probably all of you, the video is in Chinese, so, but even if you mute the video and just watch it, the camera work is amazing and the thing that they built is phenomenal. It's definitely worth watching. I'm gonna put a link in the description. Okay, so two more things. What happened to this typewriter? 
Well, it never got mass produced. Now there was an American company, Linotype, that wanted to mass produce his machine. But after they did the math and realized it was gonna cost $1,000 retail, they just decided that was way too much. And this is the 1940s, China is in a big civil war. So both cost and political issues essentially buried this machine. The final question I wanna answer is, how do we type in Chinese today? And there are actually quite a few input methods for typing Chinese. I happen to use something called pinyin, which is a romanization of the Chinese characters. Now, we just spent a whole video talking about how you can't make an alphabet for Chinese. And now I'm telling you there's an alphabet, but it's not really the Chinese language. It's a system that they use just to uh, pronounce the words, but there's so many homophones and there's a whole bunch of other reasons why you can't just take the Romanized version and use it as a language by itself. You would end up with something that wasn't easily understood. Anyway, on your phone, you can just install the Chinese language keyboard, which I have here, and I'll just start typing a sentence. And as I'm typing in the letters, as you can see, it's trying to predict what Chinese character I want, and then I just select a word and then you can uh, make your sentence like that. And there you go. The same thing is true for your computer. Okay, so if you made it this far in the video, I thought I'd give you a little bonus by trying to speak a little bit of Chinese. I do have some footnotes here though. There was a book that I used called The Chinese Typewriter or History, which was really helpful. So if you wanna dig more into this topic, then I would definitely recommend that book. The second thing is IBM did make a Chinese typewriter that essentially gave every character a number. If you were willing to memorize all of these numbers that go along with the characters, then you could technically type Chinese with this thing. And uh, I don't know how successful it was, but it did exist, so I wanted to mention that. And finally, I know a lot of you are probably going to ask, why am I learning Chinese? And for that, I'm gonna make a separate video on my other channel called Fatherhood Engineered. So I will put a link to that video in the description. All right, that's enough stalling. Let's see if we can't introduce myself in Chinese. I'll start with that. <coughs> 好的,你好,我我会试着用中文,介绍设计,我是一名机械工程师,我有两个儿子,和两个女儿,我已经结婚了,我我提着很漂亮, <laughs> Planting seeds there, people. Uh, Nina, ni yo haizama, ni jia hunlama. Mm, what a jongwen, boot hai hao. Then share, wa, wa zai tiga, what a jongwen, shui ping. Uh, T-shirt <laughs> That was tough, but I think I said that right. Ah, uh, Ni Ming Bai Wa Shu Shima Ni Hui Shu Jong Wima Wa Shang He Ni Eti Lian Si Yu Yin how bu how? If you understand what I said, leave me a message down below and let me know. All right. Thanks for watching.